so I'm going to record and uh, we'll get going. So I will uh, invite you to mute your microphones and I'll try to keep uh, muting you as I am able. Um, so I want to introduce the Reverend Hannah Palmersheim who I know through uh, a group called the Young Clergy Women Project, Young Clergy Women International, it's, um, which is a group of Episcopal clergy women under 40, so as advertised. Um, okay. but, uh, but that's how we know each other through the internet. Um, and Reverend Palmersheim uh, used to, uh, got, I'm sorry, I, your degree, is it your demon at Swanee? My um, MDiv. Your MDiv at Swanee, and you worked at the Robertson Project at Swanee, the University of the South, which examines the history of slavery at the University of the South. And I'm sure that she will talk a little bit more about that. Um, but uh, for those who don't know, Kenyon is still a member of the Association of Episcopal Colleges. Um, Sean Decatur may not want me to announce this fact, but he is in fact the president of the Association of Episcopal Colleges at the moment. Um, so it sometimes takes people uh, by surprise when they realize that Kenyon is still a part of that organization. Um, but Swanee is one of our sister Episcopal colleges. So we thought that this was an interesting relationship to foster and look at how Suwani has undertaken that work of examining its history with slavery um, and what, you know, what that might mean for Kenyon and uh, for those of you who are here who are a part of Harcourt Parish, what that might mean at Harcourt Parish and our own um, commitment to living into the beloved, um, becoming beloved community um, process that our presiding bishop has spoken about and the, um, the part of that which is telling the truth about our, our past um, and the role of systemic racism and white supremacy and the institution of slavery have played in our church. So with that, I will, I will hand it over and I will spotlight you so you can be seen by everyone. Okay, um, well, first of all, I want to thank Rachel for inviting me to speak with you all today. Um, I have not ever been to Kenyon physically, but it is a pleasure to be with you all um, remotely, and I hope to see your campus one day. Um, so I'm going to be uh, using a slideshow tonight, and so I'll be sharing slides through most of it. Um, I plan to talk through kind of my presentation in the beginning and then leave plenty of time for questions at the end. If while I'm talking though, you do have um, a pressing question or you need some more explanation, feel free to you know, type something into the chat box or interject, direct a question towards Rachel and she can interrupt me. I'll say just a little bit more about where I'm coming from. So um, I uh, am an Episcopal priest um, and I came to Swanee to get my degree in seminary um, and then I got involved when I was at Swanee with their the burgeoning project on slavery, race, and reconciliation. Um, and then I stayed for an extra year and I worked full-time for that project as the research associate last year. Now I live in Houston and I'm a full-time parish priest. Um, and so I will be kind of talking about this intersection of um, university and academic life, um, which Swanee's project encapsulates and the connection with the Episcopal Church and becoming beloved community at large. So those are the two hats that I'm wearing um, and feel free to ask me questions about either of them. So with that, let me attempt to share my screen and we'll see how that goes. Okay. So, um, I've entitled my talk, Confronting the Legacies of Slavery. And these are some of my experiences from the Riverson Project at Swanee. Um, I'm no longer an employee of that project, although I'm in constant communication with the folks who are still running it. Um, and so I will also have some updates at the end about where the project is now and what it's looking towards in the future. I also just wanna start um, by prefacing that I am talking about slavery. I'm talking about um, white supremacy, talking about its deep connections with religion and with the Episcopal Church, 
and universities, which are can be very tender issues for many of us. And I'm talking about it as a white person. And so I just want to name that and name that that's the experience that I'm coming from. So I'll start by giving a little bit of overview of Swanee. As Rachel said, we are one of the fellow um, Episcopal institutions, um, along with some other colleges and um, universities and HBCUs that still gather together. So Swanee is the name of the town where Swanee is located. Um, and it's referred to as Swanee the University of the South, technically still called the University of the South. And just a little bit of background on Swanee for those of you who are less familiar with it. Um, it consists mainly of a small liberal arts college. Um, and then the graduate programs are the seminary, which has been there since the beginning and it's an Episcopal seminary um, and a graduate writing program that happens in the summer. There's also lay education and extended education programs. I don't know if any of you are familiar with education for ministry, which is popular in a lot of Episcopal churches. And Swanee is quite remote um, and it's on top of a mountain and pretty much the college is the town and the town is the college. So when I talk about Swanee, I'm talking about the institution, but I'm also talking about the town because they are almost one in the same, which might be something that they ha it has in common a little bit with, uh, with Kenyon. Unlike some other Episcopal colleges and universities though, that had historical connections to the Episcopal church, Swanee is still very much integrated with the Episcopal Church. And that's partially because of its governing structure, which I'll take just a little bit to explain. Swanee is owned by the now 28 Southern Diocese of the Episcopal Church. And it is still governed today, both its trustees, its board of regents, its chancellor, by representatives from those dioceses, clergy and bishops from those dioceses. So um, when I say the Southern Episcopal Church, I mean, basically from the Carolinas down through Florida and over to Texas, including Tennessee. So that is the part of the Episcopal Church. Originally there was 10 dioceses that helped found Swanee and they still are um, the owning diocese that help govern it today. So I know that a lot of other Episcopal institutions, they might have a bishop who's on their board or they might have a historical connection, but in terms of governance, the Episcopal Church is still heavily involved at Swanee. And that, um, I think, brings up why Swanee history um, has larger implications for the Episcopal Church at large, because Swanee history is Episcopal history is Swanee history. Um, and many prominent Episcopal figures and bishops from the um, 19th and early 20th century were involved in the founding of Swanee, the continuation of Swanee, both in funding um, and ideologically. And this includes figures, lay Episcopalians, bishops, clergy, from the South, but also from the North. It includes prominent Northern um, Episcopalians as well. So it has a lot of connections for better or for worse with Episcopal history and a lot of implications for the wider church. I'll just say a little bit about the Roberson Project on slavery, race and reconciliation. So what is the Roberson Project that I'm talking about and who is that man in our seal? So the Roberson Project on Slavery, Race and Reconciliation was started in 2017 at Swanee. And it was started after um, a history professor from Swanee at the urging of, our, um, of one of the deans went to a university studying slavery conference. So some of you might've heard of the University Studying Slavery Consortium. Um, and back in 2017, it was still a pretty loose grouping of colleges and universities in the United States that were starting to look at their histories and connections with slavery. And this has been a movement that was building um, Craig Stephen Wilder's book, Ebony and Ivy, which talks about higher education as one of um, the important factors in perpetuating slavery and gaining its wealth from slavery had helped start this movement. So Swanee went to that conference, um, sent some representatives and they came back and decided to start this project. It was originally just called the Swanee Project. It didn't have um, an official name and it was given a six year mandate in 2017. In 2019, it was, re it was renamed the Roberson Project in honor of Houston Roberson. And Houston Roberson is the man who's featured in our sealed there. And Houston Roberson, Dr. Houston Roberson was um, the first 
African American tenured professor in the undergraduate college at Swanee. Um, and he was also the first, he was a member of the history department, and he was also the first scholar to make African American history um, the focus of his research at Swanee. And he unfortunately died um, in 2016. And so this is a way of in, in, um, consulting with both his family and people on campus, a way of honoring his legacy and his commitments. So it's named for him and done in his spirit. So the Robertson Project has developed a lot since 2017. It's had uh, different degrees of staffing. It's always from the beginning uh, been, came from the history department, but it's had student involvement from the beginning and the idea that it would be a university-wide project. So not just a history project, but one that incorporated other disciplines and incorporated the church aspect and um, the school of theology. There are four major objectives for the Re Roberson Project. And I'll be talking a little bit about the process and how this has played out at Swanee by going through how these objectives have been lived out in these first few years. The first is research. And so part of the goal of this is to say that um, Swanee, it's obvious to many of us who are associated with Swanee that we have these connections with slavery and the Confederacy. Um, and if we want to make our institution more anti-racist, then part of what we need to do is get to the reality, get to the beginning of what actually happened, not the myths or the institutional histories that have been written in the past, but actually looking more closely at the connections that our institution has with slavery and its legacies. So doing professional research is, um, was the first goal. And this um, was meant to start with slavery, but go all the way up through Jim Crow and be talking about more racial justice history, um, even you know closer to the present day. So not meant to stop in the antebellum period by any means. The second objective is curriculum, which is that uh, the project said that whatever we're learning, we don't want it to just be in a report that uh, students may or may not read, but we want it to affect how we're teaching classes, how students are learning, um, and we want students to be an active part of this. I think that's familiar to many of us who went to liberal arts colleges, love liberal arts colleges. The third is community engagement. And that meant really engaging not just the university community, but the town of Swanee. And it also meant engaging the communities that have been impacted by Swanee's history. So that um, especially, especially means, and I'll talk more about this historic African-American community in Swanee. Um, many of those folks have moved out of Swanee, but they still have a relationship and also uh, descendants, descendants from the people who were enslaved by Swanee founders, this wider community of who is Swanee and who do we have obligations to. And then the fourth goal, broad one, that's reconciliation, which is a very churchy word. Um, and this I will also talk about, but it's basically um, looking at when we learn, when we do more Swanee research history, um, we're going to find out some things and they will create some obligations for us some communities that we might have obligations to, um, but also uh, how do we have a cohesive response? What reparative work is needed? What reparations are needed in response to what we uncover? So those are the four broad objectives. Um, there's a lot more that you could read and see about this, but I think that's a good place to start. Okay, so I thought I would start with just a little bit about why Swanee? So, um, and I'm not expecting that anyone here knows anything about Swanee history. So I will be getting into the basics and feel free to ask more questions if I inadvertently skip over things. So why Swanee? This is a picture of one of the primary founders of Swanee, um, Bishop Leonidas Polk or Leonidas Polk of uh, Louisiana, um, which there's actually a random, I'll talk a few times about Philander Chase, who I know helped found Kenyon um, and his connections are not with any of this, but he has a connection with Bishop Polk because he founded the cathedral in Louisiana, uh, Philander Chase did. Um, and then Bishop Polk was the first Bishop of Louisiana. 
So I'll talk a little bit more about Bishop Polk, but this portrait of him, which used to hang in Swanee, it doesn't anymore, it hasn't for that many years, um, is called The Sword Over the Gown. And um, Bishop Polk uh, has the distinction of being an Episcopal bishop who, um, when the Civil War broke out, decided to become a Confederate general. And so that's his Confederate general's uniform that's on the chair there. And he died in battle. And so um, he's known as the fighting bishop and he's been memorialized in various Episcopal churches in the South, actually in Ohio and one of the cathedrals had a window to him. Um, and so um, he is probably the most notorious of Swanee founders, but it goes beyond just one bad apple and one Confederate bishop. The University of the South as an institution uh, was founded in 1858, but it didn't open its doors until 1868. Um, so it was founded with a charter, they started raising money, but then they weren't able to open to admit students until after the war. But it was founded by slaveholders for the benefit of slaveholders and to serve and advance the slaveholding society based on bondage. It was founded for the education of the Southern planter class, which is to say the slaveholding class. And it was founded with money largely donated by Episcopalians in the South and in the North, whose wealth came from enslaving people and from plantations. Its founders were Episcopal bishops and um, both Southern and Northern ones. And they helped create an ideological defense of slavery. So there's three primary Southern founders, Bishop Odie of Tennessee, Bishop Polk, pictured here of Louisiana, and Bishop Elliott of Georgia. And um, they didn't just say, oh, slavery is an economic pact or it's important to our people. They said that it was a Christian missionary force. They preached about this. It also includes um, Bishop Hopkins. Bishop Hopkins was the Bishop of Vermont. He was a Northern Bishop and he became the presiding bishop, the leader of the Episcopal Church after the Civil War. And he wrote a book called The Bible Defense of Slavery. And so Episcopal bishops and clergy, of course there were um, some who opposed slavery, but both Northern and Southern bishops um, and clergy were often creating an ideological and theological defense of slavery. And this is one of the main things I think the Episcopal Church in general, writ large, needs to reckon with. Um, not just that we had bishops or clergy or parishioners um, who enslaved people, but that um, we were actually using our theological power um, to argue to defend the institution. And of course, um, Philander Chase, who helped found uh, Kenyon, which I'm sure many of you know, also um, enslaved people. So that was very common for bishops who were living in the South at the time. So one of the other reasons this is important for work for Swanee to be thinking through, um, and I think this is an important aspect for many colleges and universities to think through is, where did the money come from to help the university start? And this is something that Swanee has been doing a lot more work on, which is looking at who donated the money to get things started. Um, in Swanee, uh, this is one of the first areas of research that the Roberson Project undertook. Um, there was um, over, by 1861, they had over 292 persons across the North and the South who had pledged to support this new university, this University of the South. And they had pledged over $1.2 million um, in 1861 to the founding of Swanee, to the Southern University. And they, almost all those connections were made through the Episcopal Church. And so we've been identifying in the project who were those people who pledged this money. Of course, some of this money never appeared, but who pledged it? Um, and we discovered that we've identified about half of the list so far, of those 292 persons who donated money or pledged to donate money to Swanee. And collectively, half of the list enslaved over 30,000 people in the South. And so one thing that is important to remember in Episcopal history is that um, 
Episcopal Church in the South and in the United States in general, especially during this period, was the Church of the Wealthy. And so we disproportionately had more members who had plantations and enslaved people. Um, and so a lot of that wealth that helped to found Episcopal institutions, individual churches, institutions like Swanee, all sorts of things came from enslaved labor. It's one of the things that we also need to be reckoning with. This picture here is of, um, there is a, a notorious slave trader who were based in Tennessee, Franklin and Armfield. Um, and this is of, um, of uh, one of their, their slave trading outposts in Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, they donated a significant amount of money to start Swanee. And that's one of the, um, there's a, a geological landmark in Swanee named for Armfield. And it's one of the many places that it's under consideration for renaming right now on Swanee's campus. So one of the myths of Swanee, and I would say that many churches and institutions have myths like this, has been that because it didn't open its doors for students until after the Civil War, it somehow escaped the taint of slavery. If it didn't open until 1868, what could it have to do with slavery? As you can see by what I've just laid out, that's obviously not true. And so although the university didn't have students until 1868, um, part of what the Roberson Project's work is showing is that there was continuity of purpose and money from the first founding before the war and after the war. Um, and so the wealth that founded Swanee, even though it was after the war, was still created by enslaved labor and donated by slaveholders. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of how um, Swanee has been, how this project has been underway in our institutional setting. And um, I, as I said at the beginning, I just emphasize again that it was started as a history project, but it's gone beyond that. And I think um, Dr. Woody Register is a history professor who is still the director of the project and helped found it. Um, and even though he lived and worked in, he went to Swanee and then he's lived in Swanee and worked there for you know over 30 years now. Um, he would have said, even though he was living in this Episcopal place where all these Episcopal churches are, there's a seminary, but he really didn't have much use for the Episcopal church or much knowledge about it. Um, but through this project, he's become a lot more connected to it. And so the church aspect and the university aspect have become pretty important at Swanee, especially as we look into reconciliation and repair um, because uh, we found it helpful at Swanee to lean into what the National Episcopal Church is doing around this with becoming beloved community and with the national initiatives to support our HBCUs. Um, there are two Episcopal HBCUs. Um, and so I think that's um, just one thing to note as I'm talking through this section. So the first uh, objective that I talked about is research. And this is where the project started. Um, the project originally had a director and a research associate. And um, you know, 90% of the time was spent traveling to archives all over the South, including Swanee's archive, which is a remarkable archive for a, um, a liberal arts college of its size, but it's still a liberal arts college archive. Um, so a lot of time spent going to archives all over the country um, to begin Building, uh, building the research that was needed. So we have a blog uh, called Meridiana, uh, which means South, and it's what is on our um, what are, is on our diplomas. And this has been the place where the research has been published thus far. Um, more academic research is being published by professors of both the School of Theology and the college, um, and a book project is forthcoming. But this has been the place where students and um, researchers have been able to just publish some of the preliminary findings. And it's been our main way of communicating our research to the community thus far. And I'm just gonna highlight one of those posts. So this post actually is talking about um, in their own words, which was a series that we did on the blog that was just posting um, sermons and uh, primary source documents we found from the founding bishops and from that era um, about, uh, you know, we, we published some of Hopkins' Bible Defense of Slavery and contextualized it. So really just uh, getting the primary sources out there for, um, for more people to engage with. 
So one of the other um, blog posts we'll talk about is um, within the pale of the plantation states. So some of you might have seen this map before. Um, it's of the southern United States, and it is a um, it's a slave census, an enslaved census, and so it looks at the United States in 1860 and where the concentration of plantations and enslaved persons were. So we took this map and then we took a list of all of the first trustees of the University of the South. And as I said, because of Swanee's structure, um, nearly all of these people were Episcopalian. So from every diocese, these are the original Southern diocese, there were uh, uh, there was bishops, there was clergy, and then there were lay people were elected by the diocese. And so what we did was create this resource for, um, for all these Southern dioceses to see who were these just trustees, the original trustees in 1860. So you can, it's in an interactive map. And so you could click on one of these names. I clicked on the Bishop, right Reverend Alexander Gregg, because I'm from the Diocese of Texas and he was um, the Bishop of Texas. And you can find out according to the 1850 census and the 1860 census, how many people Bishop Gregg enslaved, um, the value of his assets, and it has a little bit about him. And then we have these census photos here. So you can click through and see the actual pictures of the census, so the primary source documents. So that's one of the more interesting pieces of research just because it's interactive and it has allowed um, other people in the Southern Diocese or in the church to kind of see how widespread this is and uh, what the connections are. So I could say a lot more about research, but I'm going to go on to curriculum in interest of time. So next is the curriculum. Um, there have been a few different curriculum advancements. One I would highlight here is that, uh, I guess it's two years ago now, and then this upcoming year, um, Swanee has had a um, co-taught class between Swanee, the University of the South, and um, Spelman and Morehouse in Atlanta, which has included trips uh, for the students. So we're only, Swanee, even though it's in Tennessee, it's only about three hours from Atlanta. So it's included trips. Uh, students go to both campuses. So this is when the students from Morehouse and Spelman came up to Swanee, and then um, students from Swanee went down to Atlanta as well. And it's about universities studying slavery and slavery's legacies as connected to universities. So there's been some co-curricular activities like that with HBCUs. Um, and then at the seminary, one of the things that uh, we did and that I did in particular when I was working for the project full time was we held a, we got a grant from the DuPont Fund to hold um, a workshop on Confederate symbols in Episcopal churches. So one of the legacies of slavery and Confederate history is um, in stained glass, is in church spaces that memorialize um, Confederates or slaveholders, things named for them. And so we, um, we held this for uh, priests who were working in churches that had Confederate symbols or histories um, to come to campus and um, to learn about arts and symbols, learn from professors and um, uh, basically form, form a cohort to start taking action in their churches to either change or contextualize or um, begin conversations about what to do with these symbols in their spaces. And that's weird. This is in Swanee's main chapel, All Saints Chapel, which um, has, is very beautiful and also has some really troubling symbols. So community engagement. Um, as I said before, one of the main goals of this project has been to connect with the local community and especially the historic African-American community. So a couple of years back now, um, they started to save Swanee Black History Initiative. Um, and as I mentioned, Swanee has a pretty good archive, but uh, I would say it's a Jim Crow archive, right? Um, it was all institutional history and history of the administrators and the white students and not history of the community. And especially um, the, the many African-Americans who lived in the community and worked at the college and helped support it and called Swanee their home. So we held two different um, digitization days, community archiving days, where we did community mapping, we did um, scanning, we did oral histories, um, with the goal of building a community archive that's shared between the university and the community, um, highlighting Swanee's black history. And so we had, um, these were held two summers ago, they were supposed to 
be held again last summer, but of course that did not happen because of COVID-19, although um, oral history work has continued. Um, and we had uh, people who trace their lineage to Swanee coming from all over the country to come back for the East, which was uh, really exciting. And that's one of the other pictures. This is from, there's a African-American community center in Swanee. So um, at one point, the town of Swanee, which is only like, you know, maybe 3000 people with the university. At one point um, in uh, the early 1900s, it would have been 30 to 40% African-American. That's no longer true, but there's still a historic African-American section of town and um, historic institutions connected to um, to the black community. And so some of it is also about preserving those institutions. Okay, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about challenges faced. As you can imagine, there are many, many challenges, but I'll talk about two in particular. So research has been, a, um, has been one of the first challenges, which is just that most of what we needed to learn about Swanee actually wasn't in Swanee, it was in archived hidden elsewhere. It was looking beyond what the institution has said about itself and looking more towards who were the founders, who gave the money to start this place. One of the main um, challenges of Swanee, which is one I doubt that Kenyan faces, but it's just the scale of uh, Confederate connections. And so Swanee, um, this is a picture from um, a uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy monument that was unveiled in Swanee. Um, in the mid 1900s. Um, it has since been taken down, but there were, um, there's many, many things in Swanee, both uh, geological things, uh, buildings on campus, things in the um, chapel that have Confederate connections because many of the early professors who came to work at Swanee after the war had been served in the Confederacy. Um, and then also the founders, almost all of them enslaved people. And so there's a lot of connections. And so it's not like, you might have heard about Duke Chapel, which a few years back, they took out, they had a Robert E. Lee statue in their chapel and they took it out. And then they kind of said, okay, we've done it. Um, it is not the case of taking out one statue of Robert E. Lee. It is the case of looking over the entire institutional history. Um, I would say the second major challenge is about narrative change. So this, is a piece of stained glass. Um, if you ever go to Swanee in the Chapel of All Saints, which is the chapel on campus, um, in the narthex, when you first enter, there are these beautiful, very engaging stained glass windows all at eye level. And they purport to tell the history of the founding of Swanee. Um, and they were put in in the 1950s, 1960s. Um, but they tell a very specific history about how Swanee was founded and it's right there in stained glass. And so changing this narrative, um, changing the ideas, getting behind the myths um, has been challenging. And I would say that it's a challenge to complicate a history, um, to challenge a history of an institution, especially one that people are loyal to and love without being able to replace it with a new clean story to begin with. And I think this happens in parishes and all sorts of communities as they try to engage their history more. Um, the phase where you're uncovering uncomfortable truths and difficult histories, but before you have formed a new narrative about who you are is a difficult one. And so um, this is one of the things I think at Swanee. If it can also be an advantage because Swanee loves to tell its history and so, Hopefully the power of changing this narrative can do a lot to change the culture on campus. Okay, lessons learned. Um, really, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about this question of how do we tell the truth? Rachel said at the beginning that telling the truth is one of the, the four pillars of the Episcopal Church's Becoming Beloved Community um, Racial Reconciliation Initiative, it's kind of the starting place, telling the truth. And I've talked a lot about how we started with research and how research is really important. Um, but how do you actually go about telling the truth? It's not as simple as maybe we all believe in the beginning. So first of all, there is probably what I initially thought I meant when I joined this project and I said, we want to tell the truth. 
And that is, um, there's the truth of confronting the truth of the founders and just naming important things aloud, saying things like the founders were slaveholders, they were Confederate generals, they were upholding white supremacy, getting at the truth behind myths and foregrounding all the things that get glossed over. This is a picture from 1910 in, um, in Suwannee and it's of a Confederate reunion. So these are Suwannee professors and officers who um, held a reunion you can see the Confederate flag. Um, this is after the war. Um, and one of the main people foregrounded there is William Portia DuBose, who is not probably widely known in the Episcopal Church in general anymore, uh, but he was a very well-known uh, Episcopal theologian um, in the 20th century. And he was the chaplain and taught at Swanee. Um, but his legacy and connection to slaveholding and the Confederacy is one that has been glossed over for a long time. The second mode of telling the truth that we have learned about and talked a lot about um, is reframing narratives. So sometimes, especially um, institutional histories, they might be factually correct, um, but they're told from the perspective of an, of an institution or from the perspective of administrators. And uh, they're not a people's history, right? They're not told from the perspective of students or African-Americans or other marginalized groups. Um, and so, some of it has been digging underneath what are the factual histories to get those other stories. So this is a picture of um, the School of Theology at Swanee faculty um, from 1951. And this is actually what my research focused on. So um, in the early 1950s, the seminary at Swanee desegregated, it integrated, um, but it was a very tumultuous process. And in the process, the, the, uh, the Board of Trustees uh, said that they did not wanna desegregate the seminary. And so almost the entire seminary faculty pictured here wrote a letter saying that if the university didn't desegregate the seminary, they didn't start admitting black students, they would resign. And they did all end up resigning en masse. Um, the university did also then desegregate, but they lost the whole School of Theology faculty in the process. And this is a story known at Swanee, all the facts have been out there, but the way it was told was always about their disloyalty and not about um, the pr principles they were sticking up for um, or about the implications for what this meant or anything about the histories of the first African-American students who did come to Swanee, who were black Episcopal priests, um, almost all from uh, St. Augustine's College, um, which is one of the Episcopal HBCUs in North Carolina. So some of it's just reframing common narratives and asking questions about, you know, whose perspective is the story been told from. And then the last aspect of telling the truth is really just constructive work, um, which is uh, a lot of what we've talked about with um, building the Swanee Black History Archive. Whose stories have been left out of Swanee stories? How can we bring those back with oral histories, with community archiving, with building relationships and trust? Um, and you know, recognizing that figures like African Americans and others have been part of Swanee history since the beginning. They might not have been students, but they've been part of that history. And so um, I think university institutions almost always focus on the students and the faculty and the institution, but there are many, many other people who help make a university run and work. And what about those stories? So all those parts of those go into telling the truth. Um, and that's been a, um, I think, you know, that work will not ever be done at Swanee, but it's been, uh, that's been where a lot of the energy has been focused. Uh, this is a picture of our advisory board in one of our meetings. So we have a community advisory board of alumni and various members, you know, uh, students, um, uh, community stakeholders. And so I just have this picture here to talk about how it really is university-wide engagement and not just for history classes, um, but incorporating it um, into other spaces as well. So I will talk a little bit about what lies ahead. So this is the Becoming Beloved Community uh, Labyrinth. Some of you might have seen it before. It comes to us from the National Church. They talk about telling the truth, proclaiming the dream, practicing the way of love, and repairing the breach. And so what is ahead for Swanee? There's been a lot of development even since I left uh, Swanee last June. 
Um, more staff have been hired. They just got a major grant to the Council of Independent Colleges in Yale. Um, more classes, more publications. Um, but I think this labyrinth helps describe what this process of reconciliation and repair is going to look like which is that um, this cannot be a kind of one and done thing. It can't be just one institutional report on our legacy and then we're over. And some of this is where theology, I think, can help us. Because in the Episcopal Church, when we think about confession and repentance, we talk about confession, which is truth telling, saying what you have done wrong. You have to know what you've done wrong, but saying it, admitting it. And then for true repentance, you have to have amendment of life. You have to say that you want things to be different in the future and offer actual substantive repair. And that's important. And so we've had a lot of talk at Swanee about reparations, we've had two different lectures and discussions about that um, from a professor or from an alumni who's connected with Georgetown and the Georgetown Memory Project from some of our own alumni. Um, because we need to be able to name who we have obligations to who the reparations are owed to before we can jump into saying exactly what they are because the reparative work should be done in collaboration with the communities to whom they're owed, not us at Swanee deciding what those communities deserve or what they want. Um, so some of those descendant communities might be descendants of those who were enslaved by founders, by others who donated money, African-American community members um, and employees over the years, especially under Jim Crow and um, and it could include even um, broader communities than that. Um, but identifying those descendant communities and working with them, uh, building trust and relationship, and then working with them on reparation and repair is, is the ultimate goal. And so I think this labyrinth is helpful because it's talking about how, um, you know, I talked about research and curriculum and community engagement and reconciliation, but it's not a four step process check mark. It's always going back in and on itself the whole time through. Because if the goal is to make Swanee a more just and inclusive place for the students and professors and everyone who lives and works there now, um, this needs to be an ongoing process and not just a one and done kind of thing. This is just my, my last thing of, you can go look at our blog, Meridiana, or our website. I have to note that they're building a new website right now. I think the new one is supposed to go live tomorrow or later this week. So most up-to-date information is probably forthcoming. I was hoping it would be live by today, but it is not yet. Um, so the website you would go to now is a little bit old, but it does include on it a research summary of everything that has been done so far research-wise at Swanee. Great, I will stop sharing a screen and happy to have conversation and questions now. Thank you.